now let's on to our presentation. So today, the presenter is Kelly Bearden. He's the director of the CSUB SBDC. And some fun facts about Kelly. He uh, owns a vineyard in the Sierra foothills. He has been working with the uh, Small Business Development Centers in California since they appeared in the early 90s, on and off. So he has a lot of experience working with small businesses, being an entrepreneur himself. He's spent uh, 15 years employed by an economic development corporation. And we're just so grateful for him today to present this information. And I get to be the host for you today. So th thank you again for being here and on with our show. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. It's very kind of you. And I, I really like the fact that we have a siren during my introduction. And good afternoon to all of you today. Uh, it's great to be here. It's great to talk about an interesting topic, one that I think is going to hopefully provide a lot of capital and a lot of good resources for the community and do a lot of good uh, as it's intended to do so. So we're going to talk today about uh, the origin of this law and bill that came along. We're going to talk a little bit about why it was done. It was done to produce healthy communities and revitalize certain blight areas and low income areas and provide jobs. The final regulations came out at the end of December. We're going to provide you some of the basics. We're going to look at a lot of the opportunity zone designations that are actually input by governors of all 50 states in Puerto Rico. And there are nearly 8,762 exact number of them nationwide. And then hopefully we get into an area that I'm kind of hopeful that this is going to be kind of a really boom for, and that is accessing capital for our small businesses throughout the Central California region. So first, before we get on with our presentation today, I'm gonna to give you a little disclaimer. Um, we're gonna be sharing some legal and tax information with you today. I want you to know that I am neither a legal or tax expert or professional. I could have been at one time, but I am not one now. And really this is such a specific field that you really need to contact an attorney or a qualified CPA that has an understanding of opportunity zones. Um, I'm not an expert on opportunity zones. Uh, I hope to be soon, but I am not one yet as uh, very few of these exist that are not doing this full time uh, around right now. My focus is going to continue to be on small business and accessing capital and getting more capital into our small businesses so they can do great things in our communities. And again, the final regulations that are still new just recently came out on 1221 and a lot of people are still trying to digest those and to try to figure out what are some of the next steps and what are some of the great opportunities that exist in opportunity zones. So uh, unfortunately we have a lot of definitions and acronyms to go through. And so uh, there will be a pop quiz on this afterwards. So please be attentive. Um, and also, please, if you have questions, we'll do our best to answer them at the end of the presentation. And if we can't get you an answer, maybe what we'll do is we'll get one of those legal professionals in here who can discuss that aspect of it. It's kind of hard to find one person who is a real expert as we kind of started putting this thing together. Uh, originally, the low-hanging fruit in all this has been real estate, but you know, we do small business development here at the Small Business Development Center. So uh, a real estate expert, other than those that were looking for real estate loans, of which we've had some through the Small Business Administration, quite a few last year, as a matter of fact, that involved real property. And this is uh, a use that might work for them, but it really, it kind of came down to then we, a tax person, a legal person, a real estate person, a small business person, and we would have had a whole room full, full of people trying to do this and wrap it up in less than an hour. So I'm gonna throw some definitions and acronyms at you right now, and hopefully we don't get bogged down in this too much. But I had mentioned the 8,762 census tracts that were chosen by the governors in each state and designated by the treasury. Those are the qualified opportunity zones. Those are the zones of which these benefits 
and both community and tax for investors and for people in the community can, can actually reap. We also have uh, the Opportunity Zone Fund. And this is a process of where you go through a self-certification process as your entity, which is generally a partnership or a corporation that meets the 90% asset rule in being an OZF or Opportunity Zone Fund. We also have Qualified Opportunity Zone Property. And either Qualified Opportunity Zone Business Owner Property or in a Qualified Opportunity Zone. Now, from my perspective, uh, perspective oh, twice, perspective, uh, I really like the last one, which is QOZBP. Looks almost like an eye chart, I know. But it is actually tangible property purchased after 2017 that is either renovated or new construction used in a opportunity zone. Uh, our next one requires an entire whole slide. And, you know, today I'm going to be talking about opportunity zones, but when we're accessing capital, we use another organization called the Opportunity Fund. So if you hear me say Opportunity Fund, it's a mistake, and I meant so. Okay? So the Qualified Opportunity Zone for Business is actually defined and actually for a business to be a qualified opportunity zone, it must meet these requirements. The total hours worked by employees and contractors inside that opportunity zone must total at least 50% of the total hours worked. And the reason that they have these tests is to try to keep these zones as pure as possible and to provide the benefit that was actually the intent of Congress when they came up with uh, the tax law. So they must actually, you must actually qualify under one of these or under the facts and circumstances, which is the fall, the last one. So not only is it the total hours worked by employee and contractors must exceed half of the total hours work, but also the dollars paid those workers and contractors. Also management and staff and tangible assets in the opportunity zone must generate at least 50% of the company's gross income. Again, it's to try to keep that activity in these lower income areas, in these low census tract areas to provide the greatest public benefit for actually, you know, rewarding this type of investment with these tax credits that we'll talk about in a few minutes. So again, it's only one or all of those, one or all is good, but one of those generally will qualify you as a QOZB. So some of the non-uses, some of the non-business uses for to be the qualified opportunity zone business is there are no country clubs and golf courses. Uh, there's no gold courses either, but... Uh, no golf courses. Gambling, be it racetracks, be it uh, poker rooms, be it casinos, you name it. Gambling is prohibited. So a number of these are considered what a lot of people like to refer to as sin taxes and, um, you know, or sin type of businesses that are being uh, not qualified for these purposes massage parlors and sun tanning facilities, hot tub rental places. And also uh, one of the issues you'll run into is if you have a related party transaction, definitely check that out in advance if you're trying to do a transaction between related parties. One of our other definitions we're gonna talk about a lot is we're gonna be talking about equity and we use equity around here quite a bit because when we fund our businesses with access to capital, we can either do that through a variety of means. One of them is debt, where they get a small business loan. Another is equity. Um, another one is investments or particular grants, say a specific grant like the Small Business Innovation Research Grant. But equity 
is basically defined as an ownership interest in an entity that permits the holder of that instrument to participate in the growth and success of the business. So in English, I like to say, it means is if you have a business entity, you're bringing on some form of investment into that particular business. You're bringing in investment that is going, you're going to parlay. It could come from an angel investor. It could come from a venture capitalist. It can come from a lot of different sources of this equity. Um, it can come from, you know, a, a partner or, or a strategic partner for that, for that reason. But generally, uh, for opportunity zones, I see most of this as being probably common stock that, and that is that equity instrument. It's that common stock that is uh, issued by the C corporation that is actually the entity of the business in the opportunity zone. So we're gonna talk about equity and basically giving up ownership if you're a small business person. So this brings us back to a slide we had a little bit ago and it's the opportunity zone background. And it's just, again, the origin of this came from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. It was done in December, 2017. And as we'll find out, the opportunity zone provision in the JC, excuse me, TCJA of 2017, another acronym, was basically bipartisan support for the opportunity zone provision. And, you know, it's kind of hard to find bipartisan support for a lot of things these days. But when a couple of senators uh, from the Republican Party and a couple of senators from the Democratic Party got together and said, let's try to do something in order to help lower income areas and maybe help other areas as well that are impoverished areas. And let's attempt to address the challenge that people of color have in raising equity for for them and other disadvantaged groups out there. And so what came was the opportunity zone to provide certain tax benefits to businesses that are in those established census tracts. It is important to note that I have not yet seen a potential amendment for the 8,762 census tracts that are or can be opportunity zones. Most of those census tracts probably are very deserving and, and, and needed, but a little bit of controversy has come up because some of those census tracts, for example, a study was done by the Brookings Institute and identified that 33 of the actual uh, opportunity zones were located in college towns. College towns like, um, that were near the University of Southern California and Illinois State University and the University of North Carolina. And, you know, they ran into certain areas to where, you know, they found that the demographics of college towns, you generally have a high poverty rate, which is one of the things that we'll look at. So the poverty rate, for example, in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, it's 47%. And that is because generally full-time students attending a university don't earn enough money to be above the poverty rate. They found that Chapel Hill, which is actually a, um, a booming town, but still has a opportunity zone in it. They also found that the median age in that town was 22, which is substantially lower. 99.8% of the residents in Chapel Hill have high school diplomas and 49% say they have moved in the last year. So that sounds like a, a definite, definite uh, college town to me. So, but the most, for the most part, most of these towns are actually, and most of the countries, you know, opportunity zone are legitimately distressed communities in need of revitalization. And that's why this program exists. And still, as investors have begun announcing, they're starting to do deals, um, 
Some of the projects in opportunity zones appear to fall short of the goal of spurring that development. So looking at the creation, again, why we created and why opportunity zones were created by Congress, you'll see that opportunity zones have a much higher poverty rate than the United States in whole. It's almost twice as much. You'll look at the median family income is substantially less and that it's populated by uh, many more minorities than the average uh, United States. You'll see that education is a factor. Adults without a high school diploma is substantially higher. They have lower bachelor degrees or higher. Um, they have a large part of their population that uh, is in need of workforce development programs and are not working. The housing vacancy rate is nearly 50% higher than the rest of the US and it even affects and falls all the way down to life expectancy, which is substantially lower. So it is this uh, kind, of, kind of stats and statistics of why the opportunity zones were created to provide that community benefit. And I did like seeing a few of you are out there to provide benefits to the community as well. So that was good to see in the poll. So the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, what did it exactly do? Well, in addition to the Opportunity Zone that we just talked about, one of the key provisions that was in it, and again, bipartisan support for that particular program, which is refreshing to see, but it made several significant changes to individual income taxes across the board. Uh, the changes affected over 28 and a half million tax filers and changed a lot of things for, such as an expanded standard deduction and reducing the amount of itemized various deductions reduced, reduced compliance cost. So if you're audited by the IRS, they can do it theoretically quicker. Isn't that refreshing to know? So also the amount of time to complete an individual return for all of us out there who are doing our taxes decreased by four to seven percent. Some of the other things under that particular law, uh, there are applied limits to itemized deductions for some higher income earning individuals. And also the individual tax law changes uh, these are scheduled to expire at the end of 2025. Um, the cost to the uh, US public could be as high as $115 billion a year. So let's go now to a sample of how that tax law and how it kind of affects a qualified opportunity project investment that's held for seven years. So seven years and 10 years are the two magic years as far as holding periods for these particular deals. So on the left of this example here, you see the sample calculation in a traditional investment. So on this one, maybe let's say it's maybe an apartment building. And the original investment was a million dollars the individual sold it for three million and he realized capital gains of $2 million. To make my example easy, I used a 25% capital gains rate. That will vary between particular projects and individuals. So the capital gain on the applied to the capital gain rate was a capital gain total due of about $500,000, which left two and a half million dollars for post-tax earnings. So that's if it would have happened in a traditional setting and, um, and outside of what is known as the qualified opportunity zone. If an investment is held for seven years in a qualified opportunity zone, what you find is you find a number of things. Um, of course, the original investment and the sale is going to be the same, as is the capital gains. But what you see, the next item, it says increase to basis. And the basis is usually what you pay for an asset 
and is used to then project the gain. In this situation though, because a couple of the provisions in the qualified opportunity fund investment is that uh, you're able to increase the basis by 15% of that original gain. So you're able to take the million dollars and apply an increased basis of 15% and then an additional basis adjustment upward, which effectively then actually minimizes or reduces the amount of calculated gain. So we still apply that same capital gain rate. And then what happens is you look at the bottom line and you end up with a tax savings of $56,250 on this transaction. And again, this is only this transaction. Many of the funds that are being created these days, they're creating funds that are trying to hold several of these types of investments in them. Um, many of them are right now just being actually one particular investment, but there are a lot of entrepreneurs out there and a lot of groups and a lot of security professionals that are creating entire funds. So that's a little bit of about how where the tax savings can come in a particular investment. So once you have the capital gains that you saw, the gentleman or female sold their particular property, or maybe it wasn't an individual, maybe it was a partnership, a trust, a corporation, an LLC, or some other entity. So they ended up with a capital gain, which needs to be uh, reinvested into a qualified opportunity zone within 180 days. It's the same amount of time when we talk about a section 1031, which is the like kind exchange transaction, which is the closest thing that we have right now to some type of tax deferral in that area. Again, you want to talk to your particular accountant, tax professional, or, or lawyer, your legal professional, uh, to actually get the exact information for your particular situation. At the SBDC, we do not provide legal assistance. I'm very sorry for that. So don't construe what I'm giving you right now as legal information. Disclaimer part two. So what are the capital gains and what can capital gains consist of? A lot of people, when they think of capital gains, they think of two major assets. They think of real estate that is sold either as a residence, a, a commercial investment such as an apartment or speculation or investment property. It can be stock. Uh, you could have been very fortunate and been one of the early stockholders in, uh, in a particular business that actually scaled and increased phenomenally and made a lot of money. So it could have been stock or you could have held stock for a long time. You know, it can be in businesses. The capital gains can actually occur in a particular business. It could even be collectible. So say, Jay Leno's, Jay Leno is out there today. Hi, Jay. Uh, Jay Leno's got a collection of nice antique cars that have appreciated in value. When he sells one of those uh, off, it could actually generate a capital gain that can be used to invest in either real estate in an opportunity zone or a particular business. So right now, it has been estimated from what I have heard that the stock from unrealized unreal gains, unrealized capital gains, the amount of stock out there is estimated at $6.1 trillion. So that gives you some idea of the potential size of the capital gains out there to invest in real estate or invest in businesses. And so to come up with this, the IRS came up with a new form, Form 8949, uh, I kind of glanced at the form. I didn't, I didn't put it up, but the new form is, is similar, similar and is used in conjunction if you're aware of a Schedule D form that lists uh, what it is you're selling or your capital gain and if it's short or long term. But again, uh, that's for somebody that makes a lot more money than me for you to talk to about. 
So before the opportunity zone, I did mention that Section 1031 like kind of exchanges were kind of kind of the deal. And the problem with and compared to opportunity zones is that with an opportunity zone, any asset, not only real estate, can be exchanged. Um, in a 1031 exchange, it has to be real estate. And the very nature of like kind means that if you are uh, reinvesting your capital gains in our apartment complex that we talked earlier, that you would need to reinvest that into another apartment complex. And you would need to use a third party to do so. So also with the opportunity zone, it allows you to invest the capital gains, but uh, given if you can take it to its entire 10 year term, uh, it's possible to actually either defer the entire full gain rather than just the capital gain of that and eliminates future capital gains entirely. So those are some of the, the tax benefits. So for you that wanted a little bit of a, what I like to call novice tax advice. Uh oh, they're coming to get me. Comes the siren. Uh, there it is. Okay, so the census tracts, we talked about a few times now uh, that there are 8,762 of these census tracts across the country. I know you kind of are wondering where they are, and there they are, right there. The largest number of them are in the great state of California. And many find it a surprise that uh, Puerto Rico, a U.S. territory, is the second most. And that is most likely largely because of the massive uh, disaster that they experienced a few years back with uh, Hurricane, um, Hurricane, I don't remember. So then you get into, you know, some others, you get into uh, Texas, obviously great size. And it comes all the way down to your right hand corner of the screen. I don't know if you can see that, but with, uh, with only 16 census tracts is the state of Virginia. And next to that is uh, the state of Arkansas. So, you know, 13 states have 32 or fewer census tracts. And uh, California, we have here 879. So that's kind of, and again, as I mentioned to you earlier, those are created and selected by the governor of that state. And, um, and we kind of discussed a little bit earlier about the controversy of the 33 college towns and the fact that in those particular opportunity zones, it actually, there's a result, it results in varying degree of economic distress among the zones. So some zones are particularly much more distressful than others. And there's a lot of people in the investment uh, world that believe that those are going to create the most interest from investors early on. Hopefully they're wrong, but that's the intent so far or the expectation. So investors who wait might not get the full benefits as uh, you have the seven and 10 year plan and a few of them actually expire. Um, so looking at, uh, at our region here, uh, you see that there is a large one to the east of us that uh, encompasses a good part of Inyo County out in Death Valley. And a lot of that is controlled by the uh, Naval Air War Weapons Center, China Lake. But a lot of that is in the uh, north of the Ridgecrest area and a little bit to the west. Um, to get into specific sites, if you really want to, all you got to do is Google Opportunity Zones. And there's a locator that will help you find a particular track if you're located in a particular area. So see, these are some of the ones in, uh, you, know, you see a small one here in Bakersfield in the downtown area that we'll, we'll look at a little bit later. Uh, uh, and all a little bit north getting in above the Kern County line there, 
uh, just a little bit in Delano and then getting up into the communities uh, of Southern Tulare County and a much larger area in Fresno and then west of Fresno, moving on up the San Joaquin Valley. So there's a few of the, the funds that are located there. Uh, some of the local issues that we're running into and some of the local issues are that uh, California, a handful of other states are actually what considered non-conforming states and have not implemented opportunity zones into the state of California tax law. So as an investor, you will get the full benefits as under the federal tax uh, code, but under the state of California, you'll have to file differently, at least unless that's changed this year. And it creates a lot of bookkeeping and, and you know, other issues that come up, such as uh, what happened probably about 20 years ago when the state of California didn't adopt accelerated depreciation schedules and forced uh, businesses the, uh, the burden of actually keeping multiple transactions and multiple depreciation schedules uh, to do their work. The result is that uh, you get the deferral on federal law, but you don't get it on state law. So what is the difference between in investing, the biggest differences so far, investing in real estate and investing in actual business property or businesses. And when I say businesses, I mean literally businesses that are located in there, like we talked about with the qualified opportunity zone businesses. And the main difference is um, at real estate transactions, they have a higher floor and a lower ceiling. So um, they have far less risk, but they have far less chance for reward. Real estate, it's anticipated that some of the returns might be, depending where the zone is, between two and four times over the 10-year period of time. Obviously, those returns will vary. Some of them could lose money. Some of them uh, actually could be substantially higher. But businesses, businesses seeking equity, and that's the key again, is businesses seeking equity have much higher risk and a much higher return. So making, actually taking capital gains from your particular stock transaction, for example, and then investing that in stock in a small business that is located in that particular zone could get you a much higher return, but also would be much more risky than actually uh, doing something in real estate. But then again, of course, when you do that, you're providing far greater community benefits. You're creating jobs and you're doing things in lower income areas to uh, some disadvantaged groups that have traditionally had a harder time accessing equity. Some of the recent trends that we've seen in uh, opportunity zones is uh, the early adopter in this whole process, and again, this has only been around uh, for maybe two years, but really the first, I think, set of rules and regulations, the initial didn't come out until October of 2018. And you didn't really know what you were doing if you were investing before that. So for all intents and purposes, the, from the first set of proposed regulations, it's only been 15 months. But the early adopter in all this has been, in the low-hanging fruit, are real estate transactions. And that has been uh, the easier one of the investment opportunities. It's been the low-hanging fruit from real estate transactions. Uh, fund and investment has been uh, much less than anticipated, even in real estate and in generating a lot of these funds. Some of the size of these funds are really, really substantial. They're really large funds that anticipate uh, earning billions and billions in order to reinvest in these particular projects. The final rules are out. They came out 12-21, so now everybody will know uh, what the final rules are. The seven-year holding period, though, it, it ends on 12-31-2026, which means from the time the final rules came out, you technically had 10 days to make an investment before you got in that seven-year window that you need to hold the pattern 
So that's something you really, I don't understand that. You need to talk to your tax advisor on that. Um, send the answer to that and I'll actually ask the question of what happens on that one. You know, a lot of what's happening with the slow implementation of opportunity zones is something that I think we saw a few years back with the Jumpstart Our Business Startups Act of 2013. In that legislation, it created uh, an equity source for small businesses and gave the small businesses the access to access equity or investment type of crowdfunding. And I think what we've seen in that is also a very slow start to that particular investment. And we're seeing a slow one now. I think a lot of it is education. I think a lot of it has just been the rules and regulations, but I'm really hopeful and sincerely hopeful that, you know, we get kind of a kickstart going from the, no pun intended, from the equity crowdfunding. And we also get some type of uh, business access to capital with opportunity funds. And what we said uh, earlier was that most of the properties are actually being held individually, which is what we hope to see here with your project at the SBDC. And that's another you know, resource that we wanna make sure you know about. If you have a specific project, come into your small business development center and we can work with you on that particular uh, project that we know the facts and circumstances, particularly if it's an accessing capital particular project or maybe you want to locate a capital, your headquarters, your uh, corporate headquarters in an opportunity zone or a manufacturing facility grow it within that zone as well. But what we're seeing is individual properties rather than larger funds, which kind of caught me by surprise when I was doing the analysis and, and data work for this particular webinar. Okay, some of the local projects uh, or what I call the suspected ones because Still, it's kind of quiet and it's still very early, but on a trip to uh, our Eastern Sierra region a couple of weeks ago, I was in Bishop, California and uh, learned of an older building in a qualified opportunity zone that was being converted to a rural health clinic. And that is a great project because not only does it take a, uh, an existing building that needed renovation out, it also creates a community beneficial project for it and provides health care which is vitally needed in many of our rural communities. So that's a project that uh, we were happy to learn about. Um, another project that I think is an opportunity zone project, but I have not talked to anybody about it, just from what I've read in the newspaper, uh, is here in downtown Bakersfield, a whole block from our office, and it's older properties, two older properties that were purchased by Bitwise, and they're currently being renovated. Uh, Bitwise is a real estate and technology company that based out of Fresno has done some great things up there um, in about four or five uh, buildings. I've had a chance to, uh, to tour their facility a, a few times now, and, and uh, they announced that they wanted to expand into other communities and uh, Bakersfield was the first community they expanded into. Um, I believe they purchased the two buildings that are located uh, downtown on the corner of 17th, excuse me, 18th and I streets, or H streets, 18th and H. And, uh, and I'm assuming that they're utilizing opportunity zones. Again, don't know, nobody's told me, nobody's, uh, talked, but I do know that that was a qualified opportunity zone because I have researched that in our particular backyard and know that that was a uh, qualified opportunity zone census track, one of the 8,762. Um, right there, you'll see the renovation going on, on and uh, great structure, uh, great public benefit for the downtown area. Um, and going back, you'll see its neighbor across the street, which is the uh, historic boutique uh, Padre Hotel. And uh, next to it, you'll see the Merle Haggard uh, Library. So, and on the other side of that, you'll see the Greyhound bus station. Yeah, which, who knows, maybe that can be a 
qualified opportunity some project one of these days. So um, what are others doing in their, with their projects? Uh, there's some really big, exciting projects that are going on. One of them is uh, an organization, a company called Urban Catalyst. And they're not doing a small scale project. Here at the SBDC, we hope to see, you know, your individual projects one at a time. They're looking at doing a huge house over 100 qualified opportunity zone businesses, startups in San Jose. Now, having, having occupied and doing a incubator in a qualified opportunity zone business project, is great. It's like what Bitwise is doing. And if Bitwise houses businesses, which we expect them to do, or leases space to them, as long as they don't do triple net, triple net is a no-no in this, uh, then those businesses are able to actually raise capital through opportunity zones. That's great. That is really a real benefit for a business to be there where they can potentially uh, take the capital gains from an investor and actually use those in the business. So that's what they want to do in San Jose, California, where they do have a little bit of technology going on there now. Um, last time I was there. And they're looking to raise about $250 million and have seven different sites, multiple tenant buildings, and uh, exciting project, I guess, if they can pull it off and, and rehab some of their um, less than desirable areas and to continue with what they've been doing in that particular region. An example of a project might be something like this that we see. Let's say, for example, this afternoon in walks the door, a small manufacturer. And, um, you know, he wants to make about a $4 million investment in real property. Maybe he doesn't qualify for the SBA 504 loan, or he doesn't want debt, um, um, or maybe there's some reason uh, Mid-State Development Corporation can't help him. So what he does is he finds an investor who say is just cashed out of a stock and has a capital gain of about a million dollars. That investor has 180 days and actually can actually um, then invest that in the particular business. He can invest it in the building and he can defer that tax until 2026. Okay, um, I hope I've left enough time. I didn't, I didn't leave much time at all for questions, but uh, that's scratching the surface on a complex and very difficult uh, issue to wrap up in 55 minutes. Um, I think we have some questions. Elizabeth, do we have questions? Yes, Kelly. Thank you so much for presenting that information to us. Uh, we, have, we have a few questions uh, that we'll start with. If you have any questions that aren't too specific, Please submit them through Q and A. If they are very specific, we will take that offline with you. Uh, but one of the questions that that do you think legal cannabis businesses qualify for an opportunity zone? Wow, that's uh, I didn't see that one coming, but I guess I should have. Um, my thinking is this is a federal program and it's federal taxation. I know the intent by uh, the Department of Treasury was not to include cannabis businesses. I have read a little bit on this and it seemed to be inconclusive. So I think that that is something that's going to need more discussion and more uh, research into. Here at the SBDC, the Small Business Development Centers, uh, actually all of them across the country, all thousand plus of them across the country, cannot work with cannabis businesses, even though it is uh, legal in the state of California. And, uh, but it is against the law from a federal perspective and our funding comes from the US Small Business Administration. So that is a good question because the funding aspect isn't involved, but I think we need to get more question, more more uh, questions and uh, more answers for you on that topic. All right, thank you. So taking it back to prohibited businesses, uh, when it comes to sin businesses, like uh, adult clubs and other things, does this also apply to, uh, to manufacturers and wholesalers of these uh, sin business? 
items? My, uh, my interpretation would be yes, but if I was in one of those types of businesses, I would seek more clarity. And um, maybe it's something, if it is, it is something that could come up as being something that's litigated and uh, uh, by somebody else and you get actually some actual results of people that are, um, that are, are, that are not subject to it. All right. So coming down to finding, uh, finding investment, how would a, a small business find an investment group or uh, opportunity fund? Or That's a great question. Um, and, you know, again, it's something that is kind of the difficult part of that is finding any type of equity investment or finding an investor. Uh, you know of equity groups such as angel funds. We have one here locally, the Kern Venture Group and Venture Capital Groups and others you can find. Uh, finding an individual who's willing to invest in that, oftentimes that takes word of mouth. It can actually be advice that comes from a particular uh, accounting professional, a CPA, or maybe a legal professional, uh, an attorney, maybe one that does securities, or, you know, it's just uh, it's trying to find somebody or, you know, word of mouth. So it's that age old problem of there's equity capital out there. How do I find it? Thank you. Another question. <clears throat> Can an Opportunity Zone fund invest into an existing business that might want to sell a minority interest or could it acquire a, an existing minority interest? Hmm. That uh, would need a little bit further to be, need a little bit more information on that and also uh, if it it's in the if it's in the opportunity zone for business, uh, I would say it's possible, but it has to meet all those tests. And so that's the first thing. Do you meet all the tests of having the sales and uh, the personnel, the independent contractors, over half of that in that particular business, including management residing in that particular uh, opportunity zone? So if you're inside the zone, that gets you in the door. The fine tooth details of that we would have to dig into at another time. Thank you, Kelly. Well, if you have any more questions, please don't hesitate to submit them through the Q&A or you can email us here at the CSUD SDDC. Uh, Hamlin, H-A-M-L-I-N at, at csub.edu. And we look forward to uh, sharing any more information with you that you might be looking for. Uh, as a reminder, please complete the survey that's either popped up on your screen or gonna be emailed to you later. If you would like to receive these slides, it helps us uh, tailor our webinars towards what you're looking for as well. Uh, if you would like to see any upcoming events in your area in our Central California region, you can check out the Central CA SBDC Dot com website and check out the calendar events and see what's going on in our region. But I want to thank Kelly again for his time and we look forward to seeing you again on our next webinar, The Yes Deck. This will help you if you're looking to pitch your idea to an investor, to your family, to a, an, any number of organizations. An Opportunity Zone. An Opportunity Zone Fund, yes. Well, thank you again, and I hope you have a fantastic day. Goodbye.